Como siempre, eh, os agradecemos eh, mucho que hayáis encontrado eh, sitio y fuerzas en esta hora de calor para, para llegar hasta, hasta aquí. Y vamos a tener un, un diálogo improbable, que sabéis es el formato que, que semanalmente utilizamos aquí para, para conectarnos, para darnos el, el lujo de poder eh, combinar eh, nuestras perspectivas y nuestras, y nuestras ideas. Eh, la sesión va a ser en, en inglés, o sea, voy, a, voy a cambiar a, a la inglés. So we, we, we are going to, to have a very, very special and uh, likely dialogue uh, today with uh, two professors from Harvard University. I have to say also uh, after uh, two or almost three very intense days, I have to say not only to professor, two friends yeah, of so. mine and of uh, ITD. It is a, a pleasure and an honor to, to have them with us today. They are part of a group of four uh, colleagues uh, coming from the United States and um, Portugal that these days are sharing with us a summer course on sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically about leadership and sustainability in the area of sustainable development goals. It's been really interesting to have a group of uh, today. people coming from uh, the private sector, people coming from public uh, institutions, um, uh, people from academia, and also students, so especially master students. And uh, well, uh, we we have a very very intense agenda because the opportunity to have you here is uh, unique. And so sorry for this marathon that we are having together. And um, well, as many of you know, uh, this uh, center belongs to the Technical University of Madrid. And uh, it's a strange creature in the ecosystem of the university because our proposition has not to be directly with research, no with education. Of course, many of us participate in research and educational activities, but most our proposition, our contribution, has to do with create and, man uh, and management, creation and management of contexts for collaborations. And we are convinced that today we uh, need new ways of provoking change, of provoking innovation, and the unit of change and uh, innovation is not only the individual person, it's important, but the, the, the unit where we can produce the change that we need is the network, the organizations, the groups. In fact, today we are uh, uh, discussing about the changing concept of leadership. And leadership is a property of individuals but is it also a property of organizations, of systems? We don't know. We, are, we know that we have to evolve in our perspective on, on leadership. Well, um, today we are going to talk about collaboration. About, uh, uh, if you want, in terms of SDGs, about the SDG 17. Uh, from this center, we have been setting up uh, several partnerships. Uh, Alianza Siria, for example, is a partnership related to international development and humanitarian aid that we are, uh, uh, where we are working with the Spanish Agency of International Cooperation. It's a pleasure to have here today one of the directors of this uh, agency. And thanks, Carmen, for being here. And other professionals from the international development sector. And after almost five years, working in a complex partnership, we have uh, a lot of things to share with you, things uh, lesson learned if you want, but we have more questions than when we started in the very beginning. It has been difficult. Nobody uh, told that it was going to be easy. It, it's been difficult, but we are more convinced even than in the beginning that this formula, that, uh, partnerships, is uh, necessary. The only way to tackle 
complex problems today. We also are working in partnerships in cities like, like Madrid, and today we have a representative from the city of Madrid, from Carte, and I also thank you to, to be here. And in Madrid we also are working with these formulas, introducing them, um, uh, 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 collective intelligence uh, mechanisms, putting together crazy people, artists with scientists, and uh, provoking uh, new possibilities, failing uh, every day, but also learning and sometimes finding uh, some valuable uh, results. So, um, today, uh, as, as always in the unlikely dialogue, we are going to have uh, two key speakers. And afterwards, we are going to open a conversation and we'll moderate the conversation. Today we have an innovation that Javier Matorra and I don't know Jaime Moreno is there. <laughs> they are going to be key listeners instead of key speakers. Key listeners, and at the end of the, of the session, uh, they will make some reflections. Uh, what we, we will have the opportunity to, to, to talk uh, openly. As, as you know, this formula, uh, this uh, unlikely dialogue, is also designed for knowing each other. And Many uh, times we we find possibilities of collaboration uh, thanks to, to to having this this space. So uh, John uh, is a professor in uh, the, the the Institute of Public Health yeah. School of Public Health, Harvard School of Public Health. And he was uh, he was the director of the. At that time, the CO2 level was less than 400 uh, in the atmosphere. But I saw you presented, I think, the work of your, of your institute with um, Ethiopia with their funding. And I said, they're doing it right. They're really doing something special that's hard to do uh, and important to do. And, and I wanted to learn as much as I could from you, just like I want to learn about how you're working with the city and how you're actually creating new opportunities for, for advancing different strategies. You know? and, and so you're, you're ahead of us. Don't underestimate that you're at some frontiers that really are meaningful to us and yeah. our other, other institutions. So by no means are we out in front in many things. Um, so if I have to clear, well, thank you so much. I don't put it backwards, sideways, was it? So, let me, so I'm going to tell you two stories. You're going to add, you're going to tell another story. I think it's appropriate for late afternoon talks. Uh, this might be the middle of your day, but not the middle of your day. Um, it, and so, this is how we characterize it, is that uh, the climate change and collapse of ecosystems and Inequities, it requires some radical rethinking of how we partner and do things with people. So that was the premise behind this. So here we are at uh, Harvard University, my school. Uh, that's my favorite beach that I've lost <laughs> ten, 10 meters of, of coastal front 
uh, this last year's storms that hit our beach. So it's, it's coming to my doorstep. Just like I chose to walk from lunch over here because weather humbles us, right? Nature humbles us. It tells us, get in your place. And uh, so I, I don't know, Javier, you and I just said, all right, <laughs> let's bake in the sun. Um, but I want to tell you the story of how we interacted in Mexico. So what you're doing in Ethiopia, very different, different purpose, but they're doing that. But to, to start on that, and I am, think I'm clicking. Yeah. I want to tell you about the center. Uh, so the center that I ran uh, for five years, I inherited it from a faculty member from the medical school who recognized in the Rio conferences that health was not being discussed. It was, how do we sustain, how do we develop but more sustainable? How do we measure things, reduce our flows? Human health was not a central issue there. So he was a medical doctor and started a program at the Center for Health in the Global Environment within the Harvard Medical School. Then he retired and it was going to go away. I said, you can't let this go away. He says, what are you doing? I put my hand up and I said, I'll do it. So we ran it for five years and now I handed it off to a powerful person. I take it uh, even, even further. But we're within Harvard University within the School of Public Health, that's our dean, uh, Michelle Williams, within a department of environment, these are our lines of authority, right, within an institution, <laughs> buried deep within a department, out of the way, and I like you to use the term, they're hiding in, in, plain, sight. Hiding in plain sight. Yeah. So, you know, so you need to, you know, pick your, your spot. I didn't want to be in competition with any other center at the university or any, we wanted to do our thing uh, and create space for faculty and for students. We were also motivated, clearly, because we're at a university. We got to create the evidence. We got to drive it to practice. That's why I shared with you the website, forhealth.org. That's taking our science and other people's science and putting it in the hands of architects, developers, planners, superintendents of schools, teachers, our healthy buildings, healthy homes, healthy office, uh, schools, was how do we put it out there? And that's the purpose. All right? Because I think the aspiration is sustainable and equitable solutions. That's what we're going to That's what you share just in the few minutes that we talked about. So, so why did I say radical collaboration? Well, full disclosure, I didn't come up with the term. Yo-Yo Ma, the, the famous chalice came up with that term. Because when he created the Silk Road Ensemble, he said it's a radical collaboration of musical genres from all over the world. Indian music, African music, Rastafarians from the Caribbean, jazz, classical, and he combined this. And that this the music that this group puts out is spectacular. Right? So that's, so I said, you know, that fits that fits, we're trying to combine skill sets, people. Your center does this. Just you, someone from Colombia, someone from Mexico, people from Spain, work in Ethiopia. That's a radical collaboration. So, you're, you're, you know. so that's the background. So that radical collaboration, who do you collaborate with? So when I took over the center, it had a few corporates that were helping out Eric Shimian, when he had the center in the medical school, I said, they, they got to do more. We got to ask for more. So we had United Technology, Kohler, Johnson Johnson, Baxter, three of them. You know many of these companies. They have headquarters here, uh, as I saw them as I came in uh, from the airport. So they, we had corporate gifts. So we, we could take it as programs and research then you pay a high overhead. But they said, we like what you're doing. So there are many, every, behind every, every of these are stories that I can tell about what those collaborations are. But I'm going to skip forward and talk to you about something. Not forward, back a little bit, back, back. Not too fast. Okay. It, there must be a delay in this. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, you saw that. You saw. <laughs> Go back to yeah. one more. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe I'll just point to you, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. So here's in front of the Harvard Faculty Club. 
We annual meetings. We have Kohler, we have Johnson Johnson, Baxter, I have fellow faculty members from the law school, the School of Design, School of Public Health. A lot of citizens like you in your professional lives but cared about the center joining us in front of uh, the solar cooker that my doctoral student developed uh, when she was doing her work in Tibet. We call it Western China, but it was Tibet. Uh, and she was in the villages. Go, go for it for me, guys. Right? So here's Catlin Powers. Develop prototyping with the women. This is, you know, this wasn't an NGO coming in to use this. The women said, we have to have something that's durable that we can take up to 3,000 meters, 5,000 meters in the summer, because that's where we go with the yaks to graze. We have to have, and so she ended up building something like that, using high technology with the friends from MIT, figuring out how to manufacture it in China so that she could effectively give it away to third world refugee camps and have us pay for it. So first world, I bought two of these things, these old camper systems. And I paid $200 so that the next person that can get something for less than free. Then she appeared on Shark Tank, the other thing. She got $500,000 from Mark Cuban to advance her business proposition. So researcher turned entrepreneur. She's running her corporate business now. She's a special person. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So the center had many programs with sustainable tourism, food systems. We worked with corporations on net positive, building health, new health metrics for that. Technologies and health, built environment. You know, this is where United Technology and Dyson helped us in that area. And energy and health. So I'm going to tell you one story from that, please. So this is the story of us working with Intrust. And Intrust is a for-profit financial investment firm. In meaning indigenous. It's run by a wonderful Mexican, Francisco Acuna that is said, listen, why is there failure uh, in our energy propositions? Either we're buying off indigenous communities and taking their land for less than the real value. They're, so he said, we're changing the formula. They're going to be stakeholders. They're going to own part of the company. So if they choose solar, if they choose wind, if they chose Eutropha or something else, and, and renewable energy, they're owners. And what they're putting, and then they get their stocks by their land and by their sweat equity, their involvement in the thing. So profits go back to them. Changing that dynamic. And, and big energy companies haven't learned this. They haven't learned how to do this thing. He has. And, he, and then the, the critical partner here is the Ministry of Energy. So Francisco and I and my uh, my staff, my research group, gave a proposition to the Minister of Industry. He says, you are underdeveloped in rural areas in Mexico. You haven't engaged local faculty in the various polytechs all around remote states in India, in, in, in Mexico, and that we can set up a different uh, way of operating to, to make this happen, a different kind of partnership, right? So what did we do? Uh, I'll point you to <laughs> So we ran workshops in, in uh, uh, Aramosia and uh, Moralia and in uh, Merida. And faculty came from all over the place. Some of them take 14 hour bus rides, spending Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with us. Extra work. They didn't have to do this. They were recruited, they had to meet some requirement. Most of them were engineering faculty. Um, that came to say, we're going to take a chance. We're going to, uh, in all different ages, full professors to junior faculty came uh, to do this. This is one of our graduations that we had in, uh, uh, in the Yucatan. And we're still working and have good friends with Carlos here. Uh, so we're still taking our class down and mixing with his uh, students. And we do that every January. All right, but let's go on to what we did. So here we are in uh, Morelia in this old uh, library and <coughs> full of our faculty students. 
Wendy Jacobs, who's coming here uh, to teach a course, a law school professor. Uh, Francisco Ramon Sanchez, uh, graduated from Monterey Tech in uh, auto engineering, worked for General uh, Motors, then worked for manufacturing with plants in China and in Tijuana and in San Diego. So he came from the business world. And then came in and got his degree in public health and health and environment stuff and risk assessment. Uh, next slide. So Lee Sharp, she's my change agent. So together with Ramon and several others, what so we didn't have to teach them engineering. They knew that. But they always saw themselves uh, as having their role in society that they're a faculty member. They were never asked to or never expected to do something beyond the boundaries of their classroom or their campus. That wasn't part of the job description. That wasn't expectations for society. But we said, you have to be willing to do that. And, and if you engage in this sort of learning proposition to become, you know, to learn more about new energy technologies, develop business plans, create uh, share uh, stakeholders in their community, go out and market these ideas. And if you do this and get a business strategy going and you have a good financial returns, by doing your uh, ROIs on what your business plans, financing will come. If we didn't have interest, this would have been a failed proposition. Would have been a nice exercise, right? Academics, they learn something and then they go back to being engineers, right? But this is where the, the progress is made. That you could bring real financing to this. Next slide, and then yeah, and this was documented. And I'm going to show. So this is an hour-long documentary. We had a, a big uh, premiere in Mexico City in one of their uh, cinema, fine art cinemas, invited hundreds of people in from, from the government and elsewhere for, the, for this show. We've shown it other places. We're going to show just a, a, a few minute clips because it, it's better to hear it in the words of some of the faculty that went through this and were transformed by it. Because they had relevance, they had authenticity in their communities. We didn't. They had this. And that's what we were harnessing in color. So we're going to do a segue to the, uh, to the video, and then I just have a few follow on slides. Utilizando a tomar no tóxica, 
que es Acropacta. Esa es una planta nativa de México. We need a scientist who understands how to turn a, a, a dry plant into all those things. Necesitamos transferir tecnología y entonces podemos ayudar nosotros a la comunidad. Personas altamente capaces técnicamente y desde el punto de vista financiero que detonen áreas de oportunidad en la región. Tengo tres años trabajando en el Instituto Tecnológico de Quintana, que el instituto se ubica en el estado de Hidalgo, que es uno de los 10 estados considerados como los más pobres del país. Hoy día tenemos un prototipo entre los estudiantes de mecatrónica que andaban buscando la manera de ahorrar combustible. Blanca and her university, the university is only, it's like five years old, and I was really struck by how under-resourced it was. I didn't expect that. El perfil del docente en este país tiene que cambiar. Las instituciones de educación superior deberían ser las que estudiarían en este país. Si son un reflejo de la sociedad, difícilmente podemos tener ese eh, rol de alguien de cambio. ¿Por qué proyectos sociales? Caramba, porque si no haces proyectos sociales, si no te vinculas con la sociedad, yo sí me preguntaría para qué demonios sirve la educación superior. Tengo que participar como académico a transmitir esa información a la población. This movement could be summarized as an expansion of the role of higher education. And the fact that we've taken 300 faculty from all across the country and have them ready to engage in a new way outside of their classrooms, in many cases, in their communities, in their states, to bring energy reform, take part of that process by fear bringing renewables. Uh, into the mix of energy for the future of Mexico. Lo que está haciendo es poner en práctica lo que estaba en un cajón, que son los conocimientos de los profesores que estaban encerrados en el cajón del salón de clase. Estamos sacándolos a la realidad para que contribuyan a la sociedad. Es lo que es fundamental. So this is about a 50-minute film that goes into a lot more details and follows a few other faculty and, and their transformation. But, um, and they, we brought uh, Nacho and Blanco up to Harvard, and they held our, my class in uh, captivated. Yeah. They hardly would let them go. They kept asking them questions and questions. Um, because they recognized that what they were doing was exceedingly hard on, in their setting and these are really dynamic individuals. So that, that this, uh, you know, so, so what? We get an award, right? The uh, Pacific uh, Economic Cooperation, they said this was a phenomenal model and they gave an award. We didn't even go to get it. They sent it to us, you know, because that's not the reason you do it. But it celebrates the purpose <coughs> and, and the fact that others are recognizing it. And, it, and the award is really for Nacho's work in Eutrophin. Um, uh, so he talked about that a little bit. But they turn it into biofuels. It's going to their boats. The, the, the uh, shipping is going into aquaculture. Uh, and he's uh, just turning a local economy uh, through doing that. So, get big. so it's gone on uh, from there. Uh, we've then started, we proved that this worked well. In fact, uh, she was in our class, and she happens to be with the Research Institute for Petroleum in Mexico. And so we say, we bring the program to their group. So part of the energy reform, they're selling off their public, publicly held assets to privatize more of this, opening it up and reforming who has access to energy and allowing renewables to come into the electrical mix. All those things were happening at the same time. And so we worked with, uh, with the director of, the, of this institute to train up about 15 of his top research staff to turn them into entrepreneurs. So, and then brought financing, we brought venture capital right to this, this boardroom where they did their pitches. 
And that was in the center. Um, so we know where we have to go. Uh, it's, it's obvious to everyone in this room. And the last slide that I'll hand it to uh, Wendy. And this is an homage to uh, her being from uh, Great Britain here. Churchill said many good things, you know, many interesting things. But uh, when he addressed uh, Parliament, uh, I guess this is uh, the, the bombing of uh, London and uh, the horrible depths of uh, the war, and he said, we're at the end of the beginning. Uh, and I, I think, if you look at the transformation of social consciousness, I won't say we're quite in an age of enlightenment. After all, look at our politics. Uh, and, but, you know, the fact that the global consciousness is, is really understanding what's at stake now. So that's the beginning. And now it's the, it's the transformation. So I can come back and say, what were the ingredients that made that program in Mexico work? Because it, it was in alignment with many factors. And that's, I think, we'll do a deeper inquiry. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I feel quite emotional watching um, a film of when I see, you know, universities transforming communities. It's, um, it's very powerful. How, how that's. So that's the bit I really want to, to pick up on is just to have the opportunity to think about how we can take universities which have typically been isolated and separate. We talk about the ivory tower of, um, and how we can take universities as an actor in the ecosystem and connect them very deeply with the society that we serve. So, so I'm going to reflect with you on some examples, um, but I think also we don't want to um, pretend that this is easy. If it was easy, it would have been done. Um, so, so there are tensions, there are challenges, but the rewards are enormous. And I think the uh, failure to, to do it means that we will not reach the Sustainable Development Goals unless we bring in universities and other partnerships to create uh, real opportunities. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples from a university that, that I had the privilege of being a student at. And then a few years later, going back to be the president of that university for eight years and the kind of transformational journey that, that we took when we made a decision to connect our university to the society that we serve. But still staying true to our mission as a university, which is to pursue knowledge, teaching, learning, research, innovation, staying too, true to our mission as a university, but working with others to create value. So we have a saying about stop uh, fighting over the slice of a diminishing pie. Make the pie bigger for everybody. You know, get that sense of creating value, something that you might value deeply, it may have no value for, for my university, but it may have huge value for you, and I need to understand that in the way that you need to understand, and if you're in private sector or an NGO, that we need to publish our results, we need to share them with the world, we need to disseminate. So I'm going to give you a, um, an example, a few examples of, of, of that journey. Shall we go to the slide? Yeah, so, we'll put you back up. Thank you. So, um, you had it on the stick. It was on the stick. Yeah, it's called uh, UPM Day 2 PM Workshop. Yeah. So, uh, while, they're, while they're doing that... Um, I thought you had added it to mine. That was my fault. No, no, I've got a stick. Um, so I remember going, going into Harvard and I had my name set. I said, Wendy Passano at the Plymouth Company. And the guy in front of me said, hey, you're a local? Thinking, because they have a Plymouth in America. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm from uh, the UK and the original Plymouth. <laughs> the original Plymouth, you know, 400 years ago, when we left our shores and came here and went to New England. So um, it was an interesting introduction my to the whole humanity. It's not an original name for anything. No, so, so it's very confusing when I'm over that because they have all the same English names in all the wrong places. So it's very, anyway, let me just, let me just uh, go, to the, go to the slides and we'll 
toolkits through. So shall I, shall I do them? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, so Plymouth is um, as far as you can go down the little uh, leg of Britain. Um, so it's very far away from London. It's about four or five hours by train, assuming the trains work. Uh, and the train, part of the train, um, uh, when they put it in originally, the Victorians thought they'd have a lovely view of the sea. So they put it right along the sea, and uh, half of the train track fell into the sea. Uh, and therefore we couldn't, you know, completely, almost like an island. Um, so it has an insularity, an island mentality of separateness. It's kind of interesting. So it's the farthest uh, university uh, in the UK. And I used to say, we are number one university if you come this way. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a very beautiful city. Uh, it's actually a city that used to be uh, a naval city, uh, which, was, which collapsed. Uh, it used to have you know, 40,000 naval officers and, and technicians and everything else. So it was, it was very much a, a city that was collapsing. So there was nothing really there except this beacon of an institution which was originally a polytechnic, but then was reclassified as a university, as government stuff. So, so it very much ended up being um, four generations of worklessness people on dependent benefits, uh, very high health disparities, uh, real sense of hopelessness. Yeah? And in the middle of this hopelessness was this beacon of knowledge, was this ivory tower that had resources, people, assets, intellect, curiosity, uh, faculty who actually like working on problems, the opportunity we had 30,000 students, 30,000 students coming to the farthest point of the first university if you come that way. Um, so these were uh, assets of the city and originally the city had its back turned to the university. Actually, the reality was the university had its back turned to the city. So we talk about town and down. So part of my uh, opportunity was to say, can we recognize this university is a key asset of place? It is an anchor in this place that we can use to leverage these assets, but only if we connect them with society that we serve. And I don't mean just the local neighborhoods, although we did that. I don't mean just our local community, I mean our region, I mean our nation, and I mean our international uh, global society, so there is a, a real sense of that. Okay, so shall we go to the next one just quickly? So we took our strategy and we said, look, we are a university, this is what we do. We do teaching, learning, research, and innovation. We don't sell shoes. We don't uh, cut hair, we don't uh, make toothpaste, we don't uh, build roads, we don't... So there's lots of things we don't do, this is what we do. We do teaching, learning, research and innovation. So say if we put uh, on some goggles and look at what we do in a new way. Say if we think about sustainability, and sustainable development space. Had some fantastic faculty uh, there who were prompting that. How also can we think about being more entrepreneurial? We're in this hopeless, great people, but we need to be entrepreneurial to see the art of the possible. So can we take enterprise and sustainability as the lenses through which we look at teaching, learning, research, and innovation? So they're the lenses, they're not a discretionary effort, they're not something on the side, they're not the third thing that we do. So there was a, a, a dialogue in, in the UK in particular that talked about third mission, teaching one, research two, ALBA. It was actually called ALBA. Okay, ALBA, you used to have to fill in a form in administration. So, um, so if I go to my faculty and say, would you please come in to work? 
and do other. <laughs> okay, let me work on my proposition. So will you come into work and do teaching, learning, research, innovation? Of course, I'm passionate about these things. So we reclassify that other to say, this is mainstream. This is what you do. You like problems? People have problems? Let's create solutions. Let's work. We have curious students. We have phenomenally active global citizens who want to be leaders of tomorrow. They want to work on these societal problems. They want to live in a society where no one is left behind. They want to end, uh, you know, kind of inequality. They want to really understand how to think through again. So we've got this community of 30,000 students. 4,000 staff, phenomenal money that we can spend on buildings and projects. Every job in the city is probably partly uh, a job that is supporting those uh, communities. So really interesting space. So we wrote our strategy to say we are going to be a university that connects. And we actually used the word with. We, we used a very simple word that came out from a lot of you know work, which said, Plymouth University with the city of Plymouth, with the regional government, with, and we use with as our word, which meant we are with you. We're still a university, we're still meeting um, what we do, but we are working with you in a deep, respectful, value creation partnership. And therefore, it means we are open and connected with you and your agendas, as long as those agendas can serve my higher priorities in terms of knowledge creation, helping students learn new things, delivering and disseminating new knowledge. So right the way back to my core mission of the university. So let's just move on. So this is where we started, was that universities had to make this shift this is a big shift for universities, and it needs courageous leadership, uh, which is we have to break down the silo thinking that means that we don't engage with uh, universities and business and society and non-profits and social enterprises and micro-businesses and entrepreneurs and that whole ecosystem that makes place such an exciting space to occupy. So we have to really think about that. So let's. So this was our uh, university strategy. We said we did four things. I think you can recite those now. Teaching, learning, research, innovation. And we said that's what we do. And we wrote our strategy out to 2020. Uh, and actually in every single part, we reflected the needs of the city, the needs of the region, the needs of the nation, the needs of the international community. Because we were using the lenses of sustainability, sustainable development, and entrepreneurial action enterprise as part of what we're doing. So let's just uh, flash on. I had the uh, opportunity to share some of this learning with the UK uh, government. So I served uh, the UK government in a non-political role as a non-executive director working for the uh, department, the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Skills. And we produced a report which said this, universities have extraordinary potential. You know, and that's a big, a big word when the British are very reserved. You know, we say extraordinary. To get the word extraordinary, we worked very hard. So extraordinary potential to enhance economic growth. And that carries on to talk about economic growth, which is sustainable, but it also has a social inclusion agenda. So it's very much around that social justice space. So that, that report, you know, took uh, um, some while to get out, but it was a very powerful commitment to say this is an agenda. I think you've heard from from Jack. Harvard thinks this is important. You know, the UK. You know, this is an important agenda for universities. UPM is leading the way here, but we need more universities to come into this space and see the power of with this power of, of working with people. So let's just flash by then. So I'm just gonna um, just touch on, so we worked with students and alumni. So uh, around things like innovation, entrepreneurial activity, um, sustainability, global thinking. We saw new businesses turn up. We saw people, alumni, wanting to gift money. We saw alumni coming back and telling their stories. Um, they helped us build new programs. They did all sorts of incredible things in terms of that student body. So let's... You told me that students started to stay after they yeah, graduated, yeah. stay in the town. That was a really yeah. interesting thing. Thank you for that. Because yeah. 
we were a beautiful place to live in terms of the marine environment and the, and the rurality. And it was cheap, you know, trying to live in London, very expensive, much cheaper to live there. But we were a net exporter of graduate talent. So we would grow these incredible people working with them, and then they would leave to go up to London. But what started to happen as we built this uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem is they started to say, I like the quality of life here. You know, I can walk my children to school, I can do some surfing at lunchtime, I can go visit the mountains, etc. I can do all of that because now I can live in an ecosystem where I can build my business, I can connect with others, I can draw on the resources of the university. I know that the city council and the regional uh, governments are supporting this kind of work and it became the place that stopped being a net exporter and started to attract inward investment. That's when you know you were a success. You know, I knew, yeah, we knew we were a success. When um, there was one indicator where we had an intellectual property lawyer move from London to come down, we said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we took our research, but we connected it in the way that I think Jack's explained. We didn't just write up papers. Uh, we did do that, but we also shared it in a very active knowledge exchange. So we didn't talk about knowledge transfer, because that's like university knows we give it to business. No, this was about a partnership with business. This was about exchanging information and practices with business, with social enterprises. Particular particular focus we had was on small and medium-sized enterprises, which actually are the heart of the business community. Great to have corporates, but that's the lifeblood of the community. Okay, and the last couple of examples then were entrepreneurship, uh, where we worked with some US universities like uh, Babson and some others to actually draw on entrepreneurial activity throughout the community. Um, so final one I think is next one. Yeah, is we created um, a space which I'm very minded by some of the things I've heard here where we said, can we draw all of these knowledge assets together and create an institute for sustainability solutions? And we have that focus on solutions and Harvard is doing some fantastic work uh, in this space around solutions. So we say, can we draw all of that from our humanities, from law, from geography, from business, from medicine, from everything else, and actually leverage all of those assets into a really nice uh, community. Okay, so just to finish, what's the last couple? So this, I, I really just want to spend a minute on this if we have time, which is what we noticed, and I think this is, is, is something to emphasize with you and share with you uh, to discuss maybe later on, is we had a number of assets in place, but they were orphaned, they were isolated from one another. So they were successful, the university was successful, so they had a, a science park, it was okay, but they were not connected and therefore we were wasting resource uh, in terms of uh, being inefficient, but we were not connecting, <coughs> connecting the dots, personally. not connecting the dots in that sense, that there was more value to be created by drawing those things together. Now, you then hit the problem when you move into uh, developing a, an enterprise ecosystem is you've heard the things that delight the university, papers and research. The city council doesn't really get any badges for publishing research uh, in academic journals. They want to serve the neighbourhoods, they want to serve the people. Um, if we looked at other assets like uh, the Science Park or some of the SMEs, they're running their businesses. So we had all these disparate assets and we said, how can we create a vehicle that will allow these multi-partner um, actors who have different funding streams, different priorities, different values, uh, different regulatory and legal frameworks, how can we bring them together in a way that they can exchange freely and not spend all their time with the lawyers working out how to move money around and things like that. So we created an, oh, that should be on the previous one. We created an enterprise ecosystem that we called the Growth Acceleration Investment Network. Now it actually was owned 
by the university, but it was really owned by the community, the people that came in. So it's a partnership initially between the university and the city, and then it became a partnership between the university, the city, the science park, regional governments, which allowed us to leverage European funding, it allowed us to uh, attract in regional growth funds, it allowed us to attract in um, regeneration funds. We had a, a massive multi-multi-million uh, project around city redevelopment. So it became a network. It was a network of networks, really. But what was very powerful about it is it did not disturb any one of the single actors. It only added value by being a member of that partnership. And so I'm uh, very happy to share some of those things and it, you know, one thing. So I just move on very quickly to finalise. That's us on the windy. So we've got lots of recognition. I don't want to mention that's me in the picture of the Queen, but I will do know. You, you have, <laughs> and I say this in America, they don't have a Where's your they crown? Don't, right? they, they don't have a royal family, but you have a royal family. So you would appreciate that that's important. <laughs> but, um, we, we were very all, impressed. We did win all sorts of awards. So, so there was a kind of upside to us uh, engaging. And so I think for every organisation, so just move on, that there was an upside to all of the partners that we worked with. These were things that mattered in the university world. They didn't matter to the city council, but the city council would have a more famous <coughs> university in its city, so they benefited. And they got lots of awards when we did things like procurement. We noticed that there were lots of businesses trying to, to, um, to start up or to get bigger, but actually the university and city council were not helping them, so we went into a procurement arrangement where we would help small and medium-sized enterprises to procure from public uh, entities. So the final one then is just uh, awards that we got around green and our work on social enterprise and all that kind of stuff. So I won't bore you with all that. So the final thing I think is, is we're finished is the last one. Oh yeah, so this is just to say that universities are an asset of place. And I think if we can help other actors understand the assets that they have in that community, we can connect those assets, students, faculty, professional staff, facilities, equipment, activities, we can connect them then with the communities that we are there to serve. We are not an ivory tower, we are a connected uh, institution that works with partners. And uh, so my final one is the thing I normally start with, uh, but I didn't dare with uh, the uh, caliber of the audience we have here is, um, I say very humbly, I mean it's quite humbly, that what we do as a university really matters. And I think if we can reimagine some of these relationships among those actors, which is what we're here to learn from you and talk to you, that it is an incredible value creation space which becomes economically valuable, but also valuable in the social inclusion of bringing uh, us to a, a community, which is the SDGs, where it's no one is left behind. And I think you've already seen, you know, very powerfully that transformational nature of education to the individual, but we're now talking about the transformational nature of education at a societal level, as a public good. Um, and so, uh, for examples there, we can come up and talk about some of those examples, but the great privilege to have to talk about something I really uh, enjoy talking about. So thank you. When, when you were talking about the third mission, yeah. the university, uh, <laughs> we use it here at, uh, also in Spain. Okay. I remember that some, some days ago, uh, a rector, some, some rectors, um, uh, did something. <laughs> and he, uh, he uh, he's not a Christian church, but he has some interesting yeah. places. Okay. And we were discussing on SDGs and yeah. universities. And he told, well, if we embrace yeah. SDGs, yeah. the third mission is the mission. Yeah. It's the other mission of the university. Yeah. And, uh, we have to change that. We have to change. I, I, I'm thinking uh, in the panel that is here in class that come uh, not from the university, but <coughs> come from other sectors. When they hear us uh, uh, to say that we are convinced that the university 
is the connecting tissue, the connecting space at your service for provoking the radical collaborations that we need to be from the international cooperation and public policy, be it from uh, cities, from other public institutions like Protect, that is uh, yeah. you know, it's promoting uh, innovation in our country. And we like to hear from them. Uh, how do you see us? And what have uh, what, what do more we have to, to do? Because of course we hear from Plymouth University, from Harvard, uh, when we uh, go to conferences like the International Campus Network, we find that all the great the, 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 the international universities in the world are thinking of these things and I am experimenting creating new um, spaces and, uh, and bodies in the university to make this possible. Uh, but uh, I would say today we are a minority. But we are convinced that the third mission is the mission. The mission. <laughs> so I would say, uh, first of all, uh, uh, look at us critically and yeah. from your experience. Tell us what we could do more, and at the same time, uh, I have to say that we need you. That these spaces have to be co-created with you. We don't want to be the leaders of uh, these uh, spaces. We don't want to have medals. Uh, we have learned from Maria Fasile, who is my uh, my friend uh, Alejandra Rojo, who was the the impulsor of this policy. Uh, it is so difficult to suspend the ego, the yeah. institutional and the personal ego, yeah. to convince others that this is a real common space that can be appropriated and appropriated for, uh, yeah. from you. Uh, so I would like to, 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 yeah, great. to have a, a dialogue in, this, uh, in these terms. And, and well, right. here we are, universities that want <coughs> to uh, open spaces for radical collaborations. We are neutral, we have uh, social legitimacy, we have knowledge, we have physical spaces like this campus that is uh, created. In, 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 in the city, we have international connections with other universities. But, but at the end of the day, when I talk to many young people, say, well, I go to the university and I have not the answer. Yes, that I need. Perhaps I expect it, but it is not. So uh, we open the floor for questions. The, the rule is uh, to to have. Um, we have had a key is two key speakers. Please don't compete with them. Come to one of the power to meet so it's so it's. Uh, and, uh, and let's uh, make the conversation flow. So, who, who opens? Who wants to? Hi. Uh, Susana, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Susana, I work for a foundation here in Spain, Protect, who promotes innovation. It's a private independent foundation. And my views are personal, not institutional. <laughs> Thanks so much for your presentation, it's really, really interesting. And I will make two comments in trying to, to do radical collaborations with universities. But I emphasize that they are personal and based on, <laughs> on personal experience. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first, I think there is a, and this not only applies to universities, I think there is a general difficulty in changing the role of each organization. There was before an ecosystem where there were like funding institutions, developing institutions, knowledge institutions, and I think to change that is very, very difficult. Um, for us, sometimes when working with universities, uh, we have found um, some obstacles because they, they don't listen very much. They, you try to collaborate in something, in some specific research or whatever, and they listen to you at the beginning, then you wait, 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 and they give you a final report. 
And for us it's very frustrating because it's like, we don't even have a chance to comment on that. Like, there is like, a, I think there is a, as you said, ego is a big word in, in academia. And I think we need to balance that. And the other comment, and again it not only applies to universities, it applies to all of us. And for me it's very frustrating. I think that um, I have found that uh, collaborations work very well when you find a person uh, who is like a facilitator in each of the organizations. And, and when you have that person, that collaboration works fantastic. But if there is a change and that person disappears and arrives another person, it's, it's very difficult and frustrating because it seems like a, like the collaboration is not between organizations, it's between those people. So it's, it's kind of very difficult to sometimes to, I don't know how to say that in English, to enroot that collaboration within the organization and to, to involve other, other people. What do you think? When you were mentioning this last point, it made me think of how did this happen in Mexico? Um, you know, the Minister Ministry of Energy is a you know, very formal agency, and to take a chance to do something in rural areas where everyone said, ah, don't waste your time. Uh, even faculty going there, most of the Harvard faculty would go and, and consult with those ministries or go to UNAM, the top university. They never got us going to rural areas. So that was the change. But the key ingredient was personal friendships, personal relationships. Francisco knew Bertrand in the ministry. They were about peers, same age. They just related to each other. And, and so it was really, we're going to do something together. So that really was it. So, so they got a, around all the bureaucratic limitations. That, that's one thing. The other thing about getting these collaborations going, I think you can borrow from nature. So nature gives us lots of examples of symbiotic relationships. And the fundamental part of a symbiotic relationship, I want to give something to you that you really need, but I can give it easily. It's an easy thing for me. And I need something from you that's easy for you to give but I need. And those relationships with you see in nature, that's where both species, both organisms, whatever, work off each other's love. And, and so you, you sort of, I think you've got to sort of take that analogy, nature analogy, and figure those relationships out in those, in those terms. Yeah, um, I, I was just thinking that sometimes when when you're looking for the organization to organizational connection, it's kind of doomed until success is proven. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really interesting that your description of the, the kind of social capital, the relationship capital that you're discussing about people to people, people to people, when you really feel you've got something that you're willing to, to kind of um, show someone else, someone else, you know, your prototype, your, you have something successful, then you probably will expose it to the organization because it needs, it has such fragility early on that exposing it to organizational scrutiny actually will kill it probably. So um, I think it will take time for organizations to become very comfortable with the risk that's associated. So I, I would encourage you to keep on building people-to-people -people connections. I think behind your question was, I may have a relationship A to B, and if B leaves, then my relationship is gone. So I, I would encourage you to have a relationship with C, D, E, and F, so that you build relationships that have some resilience. But when you feel that you've got a project that will withstand scrutiny, that you need to expose it to the organization, then you, you bring it into an organizational scrutiny uh, when it's ready and not before it's formed sufficiently. Now the organizational scrutiny can often help shape it, shape it better because the organization has a view, but it has to have sufficient um, kind of resilience 
uh, to survive that scrutiny. And I have seen often when people have said, hey, I've got this great idea, and I'm working with this great person, and they have to work at home, and then they bring it in and it just gets killed. And so I would encourage you to build your network of networks, build resilience, so if one person leaves, another person you can turn to. But when you feel it's ready uh, and can be scrutinized to good effect, as opposed to scrutinized and killed. So a, yeah. In your university presidency role in yeah. the transformation, yeah. where did you feel that you could make that more visible at, uh, yeah. with your peer institutions back in London and elsewhere? Uh, not, not until we had um, evidence of impact, which was reputationally advantage to the university. So that's why I showed you awards, not to not to um, to kind of show off as it's not my way, but, but just to say unless we, we needed badges to say this stuff works, this stuff is working uh, around metrics of value that the institution values, rankings, papers, more money from research grants. So we had to go and show that to other universities. Uh, when would um, you, other people show their projects at the university? It's very interesting. When we asked the same question you just asked, people said, universities, very nice. You ask something, they never get back to you. I don't know who to go and talk to. So we did one really simple thing. We set up one phone number, one way in. Yes, you've got your networks, but if you want something, use this number and someone will get back to you, they will connect you, because it was the com our complexity and our distraction in our heads, our knowledge, our thinking. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was, that was a massive move uh, by us, it's a lot of internal organisation, but just to say, if you, want, if you want to work with us on anything, here is some, a number to ring. It's like, you know, one, 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 you're crusty. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of it, and that was a, a really big thing. But for us, it meant that we had to staff it, serve, have the networks, have processes, know who to talk to, blah, blah, blah. And actually, we also had to have people that would work with us know that we, we're trying here. You know, so we got slicker and better and everything else, but we stumbled at the beginning. And we worked with people that were kind of um, interesting. And it's very interesting if you look at the robot world. When they first started doing robotics, they made small ones, infants, babies, because if they make mistakes, you're like, it's okay, so you're a baby robot. Or they make dogs, because you're like, it's gonna be a dog. So before they got, you know, they could make an adult robot, they needed us to have permission. If you do something silly, it's okay, it's gonna be a baby robot. So, that, you know, the way that we attracted it. So it was a bit like it was baby steps, is what I'm saying. So it's an interesting one. So, um, yeah. So I would say the embedding bit, that it come, maybe when you have some. Um, and was it difficult to break the, the wall between the city and the university? Because, for example, I lived seven years in Baltimore and I was very connected to the Johns Hopkins University. And I know it was a difficult city in the US and uh, Hopkins is uh, a very high university. But there was a huge wall between the, 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 like, the people living in Baltimore and the people at the university. And there yes. was a confrontation. <laughs> so yeah. I wonder, I imagine that it had to be difficult to break that wall. Yeah. Um, it was difficult. Um, I think it's that very famous saying, which I won't get right, that you only understand the journey in retrospect. You know, mm -hmm. didn't realize how, how difficult it was exactly. And so we have one of our colleagues that we saw here that talks about when I tell the story, it was done here, and when I'm here, it's this wonderful straight line. It looks like, oh, so why is it, you know, why is it Carlos doing this for us here? And actually, but the real life was squiggle, squiggle, failure. So it was very interesting, but I had previously worked as a vice director at, a, at another institution where the local politician who was new said, um, the university is like an elephant, you know, it's quiet until it sits on something. <laughs> and so it was very negative. So um, so I had that as a background, so I went down there. So it seemed easy against that backdrop. But um, it did take time, but we ended up doing some incredible things together. Um, but we started small and we built success and we built trust and confidence. 
And we also built our network to mean that if the politics change, we had deep relationships with the civil service, because that was a continuity piece. So that was I think you think very much there's a lot of uh, also resonance about, about what we are doing or trying to do and really really helpful. In the region survey. Ah sorry, I'm Juan Azcarate from uh, Madrid City Council, the environmental mobility area. And yes, uh, first of all say very clearly that our relationship with the University of UPN, uh, it was like the, the classical collaboration from maybe 10 years ago. I mean, we are asking for studies, environmental studies, diagnosis, maybe some kind of assessment of what we are doing, inventories, and things like that. And we go to that, yeah. and that's, that's, I mean, the, the classical relation city, ac uh, academia, or university. But during this time, and probably because people that we were working on that, but we, we, we build this trust and we maybe based on these uh, values about city, about the, the progress of the need, uh, we, we began one year or one and a half year ago to work on another kind of collaboration that's about the designing and implementing public policies with them, that this is radical <laughs> in terms of, and, and well, it's made a lot of experience, but the, the idea to, 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 well, to have something not, not critical, but difficult to find, and maybe that will be very useful for us to, to know your perspective, is that in designing and implementing public policies, uh, we as a city have some kind of a degree there. Freedom degrees, or I don't know. I mean, uh, my boss are policy makers, so we have not. And usually, the university are usually delivering closed solutions because they are like, at least in a engineer say you have this problem, this is the solution. Yeah. But I can go to my mayor or my vice mayor or my consider of environment and say, well. University says that we should or we have to. So we are trying, I don't know, and we have not found yet the, the way of making some kind of portfolio or whatever. We are trying to find a way to give, like, a, well, a range of solutions, or maybe because we, we because if not, we are trying one solution, and after that, the policymaker will be completely disconnected that we are doing, so it's no value. On the other way, it would be very difficult unless I am the mayor. So this is not the case. So, uh, <laughs> no. so uh, and, and this is also very weak and very tragic because, as you can see, it, 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 the relationship was was made with the mayor or the last mayor one month ago. Everything will be broken now. So, but how to deal when you are talking about policies or? We don't, we don't, we have the problem, but we don't want a close solution, and I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. <coughs> I, I think that's out of my domain. I, I, well, no, I think I, I was on the fringe of this, so we did work with the city housing authority over us. So in my city. You go from one end of the city to the inner city, public housing, five times the risk of asthma for young kids, five times, over five miles of that. And it was housing. They were living in poorly maintained, overheated, poorly ventilated. It was just bad, cockroaches. So the public authority of housing took a chance. I mean, why would they let academics come in and show how bad they are? But they took a chance, and we built some trust and, uh, and brought the tenants into this situation. Well, I have to say, it ended up in policy changes, integrated pest management, cessation of smoking, no smoking policies for the public housing, which was remarkable. First in the nation to do this, I think. Uh, emergency medical, uh, if, if a kid was hospitalized for an asthmatic attack, they would not send them back to an apartment that caused the attack. 
before they were. And then they go right back in a couple of weeks later. So they, we started to figure out the system together. And, and I think, and we couldn't implement any policy. We only could say, here's the evidence. And the interesting thing is the tenants that lived in that would often say, we needed the academy to come in and tell them what we do already. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't have authority. They didn't have power. We had the power of knowledge and respect, and therefore the policy stuck. Mm -hmm. So I, it was just that formulation that that uh, just the time and place and the people there ready to engage made that magic. And, you know, so that, you, you yeah. probably, no, I, had, I had a call from home, so I think okay. I better take it off. I'll be yeah, back in a second. Um, I think you're, you're highlighting, I think that's, that's an excellent question, because I think you're highlighting a key barrier and a key major at the same time. It's the same time. So, so what you're saying is there is a level of comfort in having this transactional, you know, you need some information, you've got some smart people, you ask them, it's a transactional encounter. And what we are now trying to do is to move deeper into the strategic space. But I think what we need to reserve is the policy making as a democratic activity. We should not as universities get involved in that is very dangerous for university. So we used to have to draw some lines to say, you know, we will create, you know, we will work with you in a strategic way, which is about co-creation. What we can do is, uh, Carl said, it, um, we can be a neutral actor. So we can maybe do some of the user, uh, user voice research with you. We can create a series of options with you. But at the end of the day, the mayor is the mayor because people, as a democratic, uh, piece there, so we must never get involved in that. There's one uh, example which I'll give you, which is very negative, where the city wanted to put in this big incinerator, uh, and, and they did, and whatever. But they came to the university saying, Can you do the studies to show that this is fine? Um, because we need to go and say, Because we love the university, we love the And when you say, We said, No, this is not our role to do studies. You cannot tell us what outcome you want because we're neutral. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, so you can see how it can go wrong if you don't have a respect for where those boundaries are. So I think what you're, you're highlighting is, is a critical uh, piece of let's get this right of where do you hand over to the city and the city is the lead. I mean, the city did the deals. We did, you know, so where does the city absolutely lead? Where does the university enable, facilitate, support? Where does the university lead and the city supports and able to facilitate? And they are different spaces. And I think what, what you're highlighting is the risk of thinking is we're all in one big family, we're all in one big thing, it's the same thing, it's not the same thing. So, so the um, partnership has to uh, respect the differences profoundly. It has to respect the shared value space for family. But if we think that by being in partnership we're the same, that's where we make the mistake. So I think I think articulating where we have fundamental differences, where the lines are, where one hand's over to the other, one hand's back, you know, that's where it's really, really important. So for me, your question is a profound question, because I think you've gone to the heart of when it goes wrong, um, that's the kind of thing when it goes wrong. When the mayor would stand up and say, the university says. Now I'm sitting in my in my back, you know, my kitchen, thinking, I don't care what the university says. You know, this is what it, and then you get and then you have to rebuild all yeah. of the things at top. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you want the mayor to say we, we took sound advice. Actually, because our university is good, we took some advice from our university. We also tested it with users. We also did, you know, we did our due diligence as a city. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a series of options, and this is the one that I as you are am recommending. So but the idea that you bring the university is like that's just good. so it's a, excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really good. There were more questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Carmen. Yes. I'm from the Spanish Agency for International Development. We just had lunch hearing about your wonderful project in uh, Ethiopia. So thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah.
Yeah, um, so first of all, thanks so much. It's a privilege to be here and to be able to listen to you and to be part of this conversation. Um, uh, actually, my question has already been answered, which was uh, how do you go from persons being the basis of partnerships to those partnerships becoming a structural or strategy? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You already answered. Okay. I gave you so, so many yeah. things already. So okay. I okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I was struck by, by one, one thing is that I have the feeling well, in both of, of your presentations, um, th th there was this thought of um, citizens uh, wanting of this willingness to to uh, to give back, uh, to contribute, uh, or to give back to society whatever you have already received, which is something which I believe is uh, very different <coughs> from the conception we have here in, in Spain. I think okay. we, uh, it has to do also with the maturity of civil society. Yeah. Uh, I think. Either we don't trust ourselves so much and we think we don't have that much to offer, either we rely too much on the state and we think mm -hmm. he, 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 well, the state is too wonderful to provide for everything. So I believe this is a, this, okay. this is a challenge sure. there. Um, you know, so yeah, that's also a very personal one. So, um, so just <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. So can you tell me what, what things were making you think that? Because, you know, the people, I'd be really interested in what messages you were getting there, you know, because if you if you go into this city that I was talking about, you know, it's uh, people who are out of work for a long time and dependent to them, so they're not giving. So it's really interesting. So tell me what what messages both from and yeah, I'm feeling also it's yeah. Yeah. from the station from from yeah. The, um, yeah, and perhaps we don't have to live in the states. Yeah, and there yeah. when there's a you know, very uh, uh, I don't know a catastrophe or yes. something. Yes. The civil society reacts very quickly, and it's, it's quite already organized. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I believe they, 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 they have the conviction that they need to give back, to return, okay. yeah. to yeah. contribute. Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't have the feeling we have that, such yeah. a conviction uh, here yet. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's changing also. I think what you're, what you're also kind of referencing is you cannot take the model I described, the model that Jack described, the model of other other collaborations, and nail it on to you. There is a, um, a really important cultural uh, contextualization. So I think that what you're doing with, through through your work, Carlos, is you're hearing lots of ideas, you're creating options, and you will pick some of the things you like which resonate, and you will knit something quite unique. Here, and uh, I think that's the that's the way to go. Because you're right, there are some assumptions underneath this, uh, which which may not translate. And I think that's a really important message that you have to invent it here. It hasn't been solved, <laughs> so that's a uh, heavy lifting back to you guys. Yeah, yeah. 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 that I took from from actually partnership start with with oneself. Yeah. With uh, first of all wanting to share, but yeah. also knowing yourself, yeah. yourself, and that you can use your assets. Absolutely, yeah. I think Absolutely. that's 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 the basic one. Is going to any relationship. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And regarding university, yeah. I, I want to 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 give just uh, uh, perhaps a more positive note. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, uh, we have the, the tendency. Uh, at least in the Spanish agency of international cooperation for development to go to universities only to uh, demand the experts you know, to implement our projects. And that's what, that, that was mostly it. And now, I think we are, we are discovering each other. And uh, my experience that, uh, what I've discovered is that actually universities are ready to take the challenge to look for answers, which is something that uh, in public institutions, I don't think we do that much. I mean, we, I don't know. And, and uh, also, um, uh, they are like small labs. Yes. When you can, yes. Well, well, let's try it. Yeah. And it's yeah. wrong a lot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's already interesting. It has a value yeah. in itself, even if it's wrong. Uh, and in, in public uh, institutions, we, we cannot do that because yeah. we have to to, yeah. uh, to explain to our uh, citizens what we have faith. So well, uh, I think this, it's, it, it's an enormous change. 
right. So that's a huge step because what what you know the, the value then is that you can have the university will put that information out and you can disseminate that to be work here. This work yeah. here. Yeah. You know, so that's that wonderful that, that sense of prototyping, that's a learning organization. That's wonderful. It brings yeah. brings up another Winston Churchill quote. Ah. <laughs> Success is not nice. final <laughs> and failure is not fatal. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Thank Thank you. You. Very good. Thank Sorry. You. I think we have time. Uh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can take two or three questions, yeah, a round or two or three. No. We don't have answer that else. There. <laughs> we have some people, I, I didn't say. We have people from the business sector. We have people from the NGO sector. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And maybe it's a uh, reason coming from the NGO. Uh, I would like to, to raise an issue uh, about uh, funding. How the funding may distort uh, some the need for funding may distort some of, of, the, of the work in Paris. I think oh, on the theory we may or relatively easily agree on the, on the need for partnership for uh, cooperating public, private sector, academia, and society. Mean, uh, we may be all of us uh, fully aware and convinced of, uh, on the basis of that. Uh, but when it comes to day-to-day -to -day practice, uh, I'm going to put it into practice, very often the situation is that uh, both in the academia and the civil society organization, we have uh, knowledge, we have uh, field experience, we have practical experience, knowledge, and we have funding. We have many ideas, we can do things here and there, and we have uh, And we often tend to look at uh, both uh, public institutions and private sectors as funding. So we agree on the theory and so, but in the end, we have an idea that we may think of ourselves as being, uh, being placed for playing the role of facilitator. We may be aware of the needs of one and the other and, and the requirements of, of everybody, uh, but we do not have funds. Uh, and therefore, uh, when building the idea of a partnership or whatever, uh, there is often, or I see often, a, a conflict between uh, what is good for the partnership as a whole, for everything going well, and for our own organization or our own idea, which we, we may be uh, convinced that if our idea is, is good and we need 10,000 or 10 million in a euro to put it into, into practice. And we know that uh, this public institution or this uh, private company or corporate foundation or whatever has uh, one or uh, one thousand or a million uh, euro available for that. Uh, and this, uh, mm, at the same time, this uh, causes some kind of say, risk of competition among ourselves. Uh, we may have our own idea, the academic institutions may have another slightly or highly yeah. different idea, another NGO may have some different idea, and we may be, all of us, uh, competing among uh, ourselves for raising the money from the public or the private institution, rather than trying to build the, the, the best for, for the partnership uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, I, and I see this as a, a real difficult uh, strategic uh, point in, in the designing and uh, the operation of the, of, of the partnerships. What can you do about it? Well, I'll touch on uh, 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 Sorry, I want to, to take two uh, okay. more questions okay. because we, uh, the time runs. Yeah, sure. uh, I think yeah. we have 10 minutes left. And here we have more questions. Well, we'll get back to answer these uh, questions. We can only answer them in the last round. So we have two questions here. Someone more? Okay. Um, I am Manuel. I'm working as a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to 
know what's the role of the student in all the sustainability uh, way because um, I think if you can convince a teenager, you can convince almost everything. <laughs> so, uh, if you could give me a clue for your adults, yeah. I, maybe I can convert. What do you teach? What year? Technology. Uh, Design and technology. to give a little bit of resource 
to just ignite the beginning and originate something. Uh, it might be a very small, it might be five hundred dollars or it's fifty euro. It might be just a very small resource. So repurpose within your current envelope something, maybe a small thing to ignite the thing you want to see. And when you have ignited it and started it, you will find, if it's good, it might just fall over and fail and learn something, um, you may find then that new resources turn up. So when we were doing uh, some work, we do a, a practical example. Uh, we were saying that we do research, we want to connect the research, we do it with the community. We put a very small amount of money into what we call community research awards. It was an idea I stole from Japan, they were working very successfully. We put community research awards, we said, dear community, people who live around university, social enterprises, NGOs, if you have problems, questions, research questions, come talk to us. If we like them and we can find a faculty member who likes you and wants to work with you, we'll put a tiny bit of resource for you to have coffee together, talk together, create together. But that community research was some of those partnerships were hello, very nice to meet you, goodbye, end. Some of those partnerships went on to create incredible research projects. So um, from that sort of spark, that uh, kind of ignition of the partnership, things happened downstream. So one community research award went on to train uh, general practitioners, doctors about dementia and dementia awareness. They got a grant, then they got a bigger grant, then they, you know, so it started to snowball. So I would say, if you're waiting for new money to turn up, you'll be waiting for a very long time. If you have within your gift any kind of resource, it could be money, you talk specifically about money, but it might be people's time or whatever, but don't wait if you believe in it, put, repurpose something to ignite the beginning. That's what I would say. There be loads and loads and loads of examples where innovation will eventually uh, attract new sources of income. It's whether you can get it to the right stage of that income. So that, I, if I go at that one, I'd love to go back to the student one, but you know you don't. No, no, no. We should both do student and you do Susanna. Well, I don't know. You're going to be done. Oh, good. That's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Tell you the story. So there, there are big issues in public health. Smoking, bullying, suicide, drunk driving. So I had a fellow faculty member say, well, the way we do this is totally wrong. It's not, it, 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 not getting the message. How do you scale? Same question. How do you scale what the do? He went to Hollywood. He went to the screenwriters. He got them to write into scripts of sitcoms and movies. Smoking isn't cool. Stop romanticizing it. You're killing me. And getting acting, working with actors to get the, you know, friends don't let friends drive drunk. They got they got this spread in a very subliminal way across the public media as a way of scaling this. The other thing is you look at where where the where are the uh, uh, sort of the esteemed brokers in, in society. You know, it's not your academics, not your government workers, not your NGO people. It's your movie stars, your actors, your actresses, it's the, it's the alpha gang, whatever it might be. And you, this is where true uh, apparel marketers, how do you think they sell sneakers, right? right? They, they know how to scale. We don't, right? So go to the media, the marketing elements and say, all right, I can scale this. So it's a challenge. It's, I, I wouldn't know how to do it myself. I wouldn't even try. I'd say, well, what's your special? That's my answer. Well, I'd like yeah. to pick up on that, pick up on that point because I would You're say, no, I'm going to agree with you. Um, so, someone make a note. Someone. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I would agree with you because I think there is a, a, a level where the academic should hand it over. Yeah. So, I would say there are two two ways to scale. One is give it away, post it, put it up on everything to give it away. It's um, part of what we do. We give our intellectual property away and pay for sending out. Tell everyone in the academic world, write up blogs or all that. Take a lot of more of your right? Yeah, absolutely. And the second one is to give it across or create a business so that society can interact with the business. And it might be a social enterprise, so it's a business doing good, yeah. doing well. 
and share it, but they find it, uh, they meaning the market, um, find it very difficult to interact with the university. They find it very easy to interact with a vehicle, typically a company vehicle, which might be a, a social enterprise of some sort. So, so I, I'll give you those two. But you gave me a long time to think about it, because you talked before, so <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I there must be it. some senior retired movie stars yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. like to be back it into the public image, give them something. Yeah, absolutely. Jolie with a small child doing digital. And then we'll be to finish up with students, which is why universities exist. There you go, you go. You go, you go. <laughs> so, I always uh, like to see the British accent. Yeah. yeah. That's why you have it on your sat now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> For me, students are fundamental in this, uh, in the sense that when we were doing the why should we connect the university, it was about creating opportunities for those students. And so, um, so the university that I, I gave you the example, I'm not there now, but as many as several years ago now, was 30,000 students. Uh, 10,000 of those students were in 19 uh, further education colleges who were feeding into the university as well. So a very distributed network. Um, and the student energy was, was a, a critical asset um, that we could apply to, to some of the problems and working with some of our partners. So, so your point about the NGO, maybe, maybe the resource that you need to ignite that, that NGO idea was a student partnership or a student volunteering, student placement. We used to talk about live commissions, so real world problems with the city council. Students would come in and they would do it as a proper consultancy. Uh, and then they would have something for their CV and their employability would go up and everything else. So it was very much about um, recognising our, our, our responsibility to deliver genuinely uh, global citizens who were engaged, who understood the world that they were going to need to be successful in. So students became very important. How we activated them from some crazy things like uh, inter-energy halls, you know, they were fighting over the different halls of residence where they were living, uh, who could use the lowest competition, competition lowest energy. So yeah, I was I was sitting there thinking, I hope nobody trips down the stairs when it's dark, because someone's going to steal the light bulbs and someone else will sell them and all that. But, you know, so competition was great. Um, badges and awards were great to kind of show them things that they could put on their uh, resume, their, their curriculum vitae, to show to employers, to certificates about engagement. So there were lots of things that, that showed them uh, that you are doing something really interesting. So whatever worked uh, that they would value, they were the sorts of things that we could bring in. And actually integrate it into the, the day job of being a student into their essays, into their marking, into their practice, into the things, not an admission. So the Germans started this 50-50 program in schools, high schools, I mean, probably elementary schools too. And the idea is that the uh, students, if you really saved energy, you got, you got the school and through student programs got 50% of the savings back wow. in cash or in, in, in wow. euros. And I think this was picked up across the you know, yeah, past year. It was, was such a successful wow. program. It was brilliant. And, and, the, and the kids learn physics, they learn building science, they learn all sorts of things. And, and they did, in an easy way, they wanted to learn this. I don't know. You probably thought of all these things. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very, very much for your uh, inspiration. Uh, I, I'm sure that this is the, the beginning of the beginning <laughs>
that are not directors of anything, are just integrators. Because we are convinced that we need a connecting yes. vision mm -hmm. yeah. to make possible this policy to, to, to flow this. Because we are obsessed with networks, of course, but we only think, think in nodes, in projects, in organizations, but what is missed, in my opinion, yeah. is the connections. Yeah. And the context that we have to create for uh, these uh, contradictions, these um, um, competitions that sometimes among nodes appear, mm -hmm. To manage because we need yeah. to change norms, yeah. we, we need to change how, how we work, yeah. we, we need to change our conception of leadership, yes. our values. And yes. so, so we need professionals to work yeah. this. Yeah. And here we have at least two, from no, 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 two, three, four. Uh, uh, they are practitioners of partnership, uh, uh, Javier Matona and Jaime. Uh, they are also researchers, they uh, are doctor and PhD in course. <laughs> <laughs> we think it's in the, in the near future. And uh, uh, they had uh, the task to of the summarize and what we have uh, that I was hoping you were for it. Because it's quite difficult to summarize so many things. Mm, I think I will speak a bit more about partnerships because now I'm involved in a complex one, I would say. And we'll leave the university site for for my colleague Jaime. First of all, I would like to thank Wendy and Jack for their presentation because it was really interesting. They introduced us to completely different partnerships uh, with completely different purposes and completely different uh, ways and different uh, stakeholders, but with uh, they, they have the same conclusions, that you have to, to be able to learn from the, from the different points of view that the different stakeholders have, look for the assets and the different, which has, which, where is the value, the opportunity to create value with, with these assets and connect them in the right way. And to, because we are a bit delayed, I would like to say with some conclusions from, the, from Wendy that you have to pause in some times and rethink your purpose to be able to go, to go further because if not the partnership could be extinct at, at the end. And also that there is no, there is no one size for it, one size for everyone. There is no a way to create a partnership to scale it up and to make it successful. You have to go step by step, begin small, yeah. and when you have a pilot and you have been successful, win your be legitimate yourself inside all the organizations or all the partners you have, and then scale up for the, the future. I think more or less I could manage to make a <laughs> summary. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to start from the from the outside uh, perspective. We have heard that we need um, stable facilitators, uh, not only people but uh, organizations or institutions. Uh, we but we need. I mean, the society or, or other other uh, institutions need um, safe spaces to, to test uh, labs or sandboxes and also need uh, listening spaces. Uh, from the other side, uh, we have also heard that the universities um, are supposed to be attractive spaces for, for industry, for example, that uh, um, describe the, the relationship between the industry. Our university has also strong relationships with, with industry or, or with uh, public administrations, uh, as one before and universities uh, are also could be also uh, anchor institutions locally rooted but globally connected and uh, the question is as, as Carlos uh, pointed how to turn the third mission uh, uh, university third mission to the mission and I think uh, here we, we have tried to to follow some some ideas um, when the when the state having quick wins demonstrators uh, reality and, and also um, and I'm going to finish with um, our well, one of uh, our recipes we are trying to develop now and it, it has to do a lot with the, with the network uh, view and now we're trying to. Uh, to have to have a clear um, sense of uh, we have to design uh, 
uh, with the network, from the network, with the network, and to the network. And, and this is uh, one issue that we are discussing a lot, how to put the network in the center of uh, the designing process. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just really, I just find, I'm, you know, I'm a biologist by background, okay, so I'm really struck by what would we as people look like, fra the fragility of us all, if we didn't have connected tissue. So I'm just endorsing you, without that connected tissue, we'd look very fragile. So, um, you know, building connected tissue is really important to keep all the parts in the right order, so just uh, endorse your point about that. Yeah. Oh, I think that's well summarized. <laughs> you know, it's gratifying to know that a few points got across. <laughs> and uh, we, there is some coffee left. And you have some time to, to talk. Uh,